Good afternoon. I, I want to start this devotional by referring to last week's devotional. It's, it's very similar to it. There are some parallels between the two. The first is that it involves, each one involves a man who was healed either by a pool or at a pool. Each one involves a healing that occurred on the Sabbath. In each instance, both men were confronted by the religious rule keepers, the authorities, who, who determined what was and was not allowable on the Sabbath. Um, both are examined by the authorities. Uh, both name Jesus as their healer. Um, the first, though, that's where the similarities really end. The first uh, turns Jesus in. He doesn't mean him any good by it. He's resentful of Jesus. And the second, even though it costs him almost everything, affirms that Jesus is his healer. And of course, both men are later sought out by Jesus, and it's the only times I know where Jesus uh, goes back and seeks out people he's healed. Of course, in the first instance, I'm referring to last week's uh, story of the paralytic, man been paralyzed for 38 years. Jesus comes to him. It's a sad business. He asks him the most fundamental question most of us will really ever answer in life or have to deal with, wrestle with. Do you want to be healed? And the truth is many of us, most of us prefer, even though we complain about it, our present pain to a life transformed. Better the pain we know than the unknown of changing. And then Jesus uh, warns him it's later when he comes back to him to stop sinning, which challenges our notion, whole notion of sin. Uh, what kind of sins can a man who's been paralyzed for 38 years commit? And when you think about what he does after this encounter with Jesus, you realize that shallowness, selfishness, pettiness, they can be sins. That's what this man is guilty of. So when Jesus tells him to stop sinning and he um, goes away and, and turns Jesus in, you see it's just a sad business. It does not end well. You see that really he preferred his former position to a life, a new life, healed. In the second instance in our passage this afternoon, talking about a man who is born blind, whom Jesus healed. Uh, it is the longest, most detailed account of any healing in the gospel. That's one reason I really like it. You can dig into it. And the second reason I like it is because this man becomes, for me, one of the gospel heroes, one of the people I really, really would like to be more like. Let me briefly just tell you about two others. One is Mary, a, a young woman who says yes to God, and in saying yes to God, has to say goodbye to a life that she'd hoped for with her husband, a home, and a family. And the first thing that happens to her is she has a baby with nobody to help her. She flees to Egypt, and she's able through it all and it all to ponder what God has done and said, to treasure it in her heart. Another is the Deboniac in the garden. He's one of my heroes. So alienated from the world, so alienated from, him, from himself, uh, isolated in the tombs, cutting himself, crying out. And after his encounter with Jesus, he's clothed and sitting at his feet in his right mind. And he asks, one of the very rare instances in the gospel, he asks if he can be a disciple, if he can follow Jesus. And strangely enough, Jesus says no. That he's ready to be not a follower, but a missionary. Go and tell what God has done for you. And then there's this man born blind why he's a, a hero of mine. He's willing to affirm that Jesus is the one who healed him, even when the people in his community um, will either deny it or say it, it's not him or it's somebody else. It's difficult for us to deal with change, isn't it? It's difficult to pe for us to deal with people when they change. Um, it's easy to deal with Uncle George the alcoholic at family reunions. It's painful, but you know what to expect. What do we do with a sober Uncle George in our lives now? It forces us to change. And the people around him obviously weren't ready or excited about the change in him. 
he affirmed Jesus as the one who healed him, even his, when his family distanced themselves from him. We don't know anything about it. We don't know how it happened. You want to know, ask him, because they were afraid of the authorities. To open your eyes, to have your eyes open, to go to that pool and for the first time see water or sunlight or people or trees, the sun, birds, and then to have to come back and see his standing in a community has changed. You see his family move away from him. To have to be confronted by the religious authorities who badger and belittle and threaten him. He was willing to affirm Jesus as the one who healed him, has changed and transformed his life, even when they excommunicated him. They threw him out of the synagogue, which in those days would have meant he had no social connections, no economic connections. He was shunned and isolated outside the community. He strikes me as being really self-reliant. I mean, born blind, making his way through the city um, to the pool by himself. He's independent. He's obviously thoughtful, as you'll see in a moment. He's fearless. It's also clear to me that he sees what others are either unwilling or unable or willfully ignorant of, that uh, he sees Jesus. Last week, we said, I told you that the hardest thing for me in reading the Gospels for the first time was not the things that Jesus said or did. I think anybody who reads them can see that it's astonishing, but no one spoke or acted ever like him but the way people responded to him, that is the religious authorities. A, a, a delegation from Jerusalem could come out uh, to spend time with Jesus, watch him heal, raise the dead, heal the sick, touch the lame and the lepers, and heal demoniacs, and hear him preach. And then when they come to him, they go, why is it that your disciples don't wash their hands? Why is it they uh, open the grain, eat on the Sabbath? That's work. And why is it, as, when, as we come to it, why do you heal on the Sabbath? And it's affirming to me that that's exactly the kind of tone the healed man, the man born blind who now sees so well, that's exactly his tone with them during his examination. Listen to these words. This is amazing. You claim to know nothing about him, but the fact is, he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to people who are evil, but only he, he responds to, uh, affirms, works through people who are good. That someone opened the eyes of a man born blind has never been heard of, ever. If this man didn't come from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. For this, they insult him. They call him dirt. They throw him out of the synagogue. And then Jesus finds him. And there's another crucial, fundamental question. Do you believe in, do you trust the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me that I may believe in, that I may trust him. Jesus said, you've now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. I love those words. You've now seen him. In fact, he's the one who's speaking to you. You may or may not know it, but in this exchange, Jesus gives this man a gift that he gives only one other person that I know of in the Gospels, and that's in John chapter 4. It's the woman of the well. He's, she, she's been parlaying with him, trying to bob and weave as he exposes her life as he gets her to come to grips with who she is and what she's done and who she really is. And at the end of it all, she can only say this, I know that the Messiah will come, and when he comes, he will explain everything. And then Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Why does he give that blind man and the woman by the well the gift of his identity? Nobody asks him. He voluntarily says, I'm the Messiah. I who speak to you am he. Could it be because they've come an into him come to an end of themselves, that they want, long for transformation, that they're willing to see and ready to receive? 
it begs the question are we are we willing to see and ready to receive have we come to an end to ourself and illusions and we want to see have our eyes opened are we willing to live a transform transformative life the truth is not everyone wants it and not everyone's happy about those who do but when we do if we do we enter the most excellent company the demoniac Mary, the woman at the well, the man born blind, Peter, Paul. They lived a vibrant, alive life. They were supple-hearted, thoughtful, wise people. It's not easy. Not everyone's going to be happy about it. But to be willing to see and to say yes to Jesus is everything. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we would be willing to see. It's not easy to see. It's not easy to wake up and to live this new transformed life, this transformative life, can be sometimes a lonely business, an uphill business. So we pray for your presence, your guidance, and the fellowship of those who chosen the same road and we pray it in the name in the name of him who gives us sight to see amen